So Richard, we've been bringing this uh, this book, birthing this book into the world, the divine dance, the Trinity, and your transformation. And I'm imagining that people might be wondering why the Trinity and why mm. now. Wow, you're starting me right in the big picture, huh? You know, and it is the ultimate, at least for a Christian, the ultimate big picture. But I hope the way we're talking about it. We're actually, surprisingly, shockingly, not talking about it in a specifically Christian way. <laughs> in fact, Christians might be the most resistant to it. Because what we've come to recognize is the mystery that we term Trinity is actually being revealed in the shape of things, the shape of the universe, and is being affirmed by things like psychology and science more than theology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet we go back to theology and we say, my God, we had this all the time. And we never recognized it. So um, you would think nothing could be less apropos to human growth and development and nurturance and caring and social justice than talking about the Trinity. And yet, if, if Genesis meant what it said, and it was always problematic, for many people, the Genesis used two plural pronouns. Let us create in our image mm -hmm. in the first chapter of Genesis. Yeah, it's a tricky part of speech to, to get around. And what is it about mm -hmm. threeness that, that breaks down mm -hmm. both dualisms and maybe even mm -hmm. an unhealthy kind of monism or everything is exactly the same? Three, and this has been discovered by, uh, by mystics and numerologists and other world religions too. It's amazing how often the three, the law of three is presented as the, the way out of oppositional two, of antagonistic two. And yet almost everything in our society, male, female, Democrat, Republican, black, white, gay, straight, we always frame it in two and the conversation breaks down. You'd think by now we would have recognized that pattern. So the law of three is inherently a dynamic notion. It insists on movement. It insists on carry through, on flow is the word I use in the book. And um, that ends up being far more important and exciting than most people expected. Because most of us don't think philosophically or in terms of numerology. But the law of three is somehow, well, let's try the atom itself. Mm -hmm. Proton, neutron, electron. Why is that the basic building block of reality, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, we're on to something, I, I think. To me, it's endl endlessly exciting. Yeah, yeah we, we have all these patterns of three that we find in the universe, and yet when we're looking at the level of political discourse, relationships, things do tend to break down along this binary of two. And I'm wondering, like, what has Christianity, and indeed what has humanity lost when we've lost this concept of Trinity, of God as relationship, and, and this, this pattern? Well, I'm going to say something. I'm intentionally trying to be shocking, but still, I'm going to say it because I think I can, in an orthodox way, validate it. The common notion of God that Western Christians have is pagan. No! <laughs> it's the image of a monarch on a throne who, and then we did even worse with it, we pushed Jesus onto the throne. It, it has nothing to do <laughs> with the, the, the God that was revealed in John's Gospel. Uh, I would say in the beginning is the relationship. Um, that was the Word, the, the eternal Word. Yeah. Uh, so once we settle for a basically Zeus notion of God, I had to study Latin for six years. So as you probably know, the Latin word for God is Deus. 
directly from Zeus. They just changed one letter. Oh, I can see that, yeah. <laughs> changed one letter the, because the Greco-Roman Empire built on, on the, the Greek gods. And along with it came, uh, rather, that's why I dared to use, not that there's anything wrong with pagans, but uh, that, that our so-called super Orthodox Christian notion of God is not really Christian at all. Mm. It's still a, still a hierarchical, monarchical, individual deity uh, who rules in an almighty way. Uh, if you give me a chance, I'll develop that later. That I even think, like many of our Catholic prayers at liturgy, maybe as many as 40%, begin with a phrase, I don't know if it's true in other denominations, Almighty God. Uh, as if this is just the taken for granted, appropriate address to God. Right. Well, if what we're saying is true at all, then a more honest statement, and I'm not just trying to be clever, I'm really not, is not almighty, but all vulnerable. Hmm. And if we would have began with God as the all vulnerable one who takes into himself all of the beauty and all the suffering of the world and reveals himself, herself, itself, in the beauty and suffering of the world. You know, I think a lot of our problems of atheism push back against this Zeus God mm -hmm. that hardly any of us like. Yeah. It wouldn't have happened. Yeah, because yeah. The Trinity at, at core is absolute givenness, absolute yeah. vulnerability, absolute relationship. And so it sounds like what we've lost is we've lost relationship. There we've is. lost our, there our intimacy with God. And, and therefore, I feel like our, our intimacy with our, even ourselves, ourselves and each other and, and our wonderful world. And this beautiful mulberry tree, you know, it's uh, we've lost the skill of relationship. And that's where all the power is at. And who's saying that now? Science, you know. It's what's happening between the subject and the object that determines the nature of what you experience. Huh? Yeah, the, the matter, yeah. The, yeah, the, creation, yeah. the patterns of reality. Well, so then let's get to the heart of it then. What special joy is available to us if we recover a robust Trinitarian, not only idea, but experience of God? Well, let me start at the probably the most problematic level. You live suddenly in an inclusive universe entirely inclusive, where you belong, and uh, a, a non-scary universe. You know, once we have God as a monarch, making a list, checking it twice, who's watching us as a critical spectator, which, admit it or not, is the practical operative image of God mm -hmm. for most Christians. Huh? I mean, they even say it, the man upstairs. How, right. how many times have you heard that on television? The man upstairs. And he's distant and he's a man <laughs> yep. and he's watching. He's always watching. Kind of like a foul-tempered Santa Claus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you say that isn't even what Jesus came to talk about, suddenly you're in a participatory experience. Hmm. You know, human beings are only interested in things that include them. And maybe it's our natural egocentricity. It somehow has to include us. Yeah. And we created a theology that we were, we were dispensable. <laughs> we were accidental. And, and not only accidental, but uh, apparently totally depraved, according to some theologies, you know? Totally depraved. Can you, when, you, you when you start with an anthropology that is that negative, as uh, you've heard me say before, you're in a pit so deep, it takes the rest of your life to possibly get out of it. And you most don't. Yeah, just to even break even. Just to even break even. Never mind the heights and yeah. depths of, of vulnerability and givenness and connection that are possible.